Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's The Scientist webinar. My name is Susan Harrison Uy, Engagement Manager for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today, our panel of experts will discuss emerging technologies for studying protein protein interactions. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and the panelists will address these during the Q&A session following the presentations. To ask a question, simply type your query into the question box located on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We will try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. The webinar platform is user-friendly. You can move or resize any of the windows by simply grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right-hand corner. You may need to move or minimize some of the windows to see the live view. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. Rockland Immunochemicals Incorporated supports the academic, biopharma, and diagnostic industries with antibodies and antibody-based tools used in basic research, assay development, and preclinical studies. With facilities in Pennsylvania for over 50 years, Rockland manufactures products ideally suited for integration into critical assays, such as Western blotting, immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescent microscopy, ELISA, and flow cytometry. Additional information about Rockland's life science tools and services can be found on Rockland's website at www.rockland-inc.com. Rockland has provided us with some helpful resources related to protein-protein interactions, and we have posted these in our resource list located on the left side of the screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mark Vidal. During his PhD training performed at Northwestern University as a visiting graduate student, Dr. Vidal discovered two new yeast genes, FIN3 and ORPD3 and demonstrated their function in global transcriptional regulation. Together with the subsequent biochemical identification of histone deacetylase as a product of ORPD3, his work helped confirm the Alfrey hypothesis concerning the role of histone modifications in transcriptional regulation, which is widely considered as one of the major events that sparked the field of modern epigenetics. Since the mid-90s, Dr. Vidal has focused his attention on understanding complex macromolecular networks and systems operating inside cells. Originally trained as a bioengineer and a geneticist, he pioneered the concept of interactome network modeling, which is based on interdisciplinary strategies developed with collaborators from the fields of physics, computer science, mathematics, genomics, and human genetics. Working closely with an extended network of colleagues and collaborators, he has discovered fundamental system properties in the human interactome network and is now starting to unravel fundamental relationships between cellular systems and human disease. Dr. Vidal? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Susan. Hello, everybody. Um, so um, I think I have to move to the first slide. Yes, so this presentation will discuss the notion of interactome network mapping, as Suzanne just told you and a little bit about how such maps can help us better understanding human disease. So uh, first, um, I want, uh, what I want to do today is update you on a really long-lasting effort uh, that started two decades ago uh, to systematically map all possible protein-protein interactions mediated by the human proteome. And so it turns out that we just, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, we just published our first so-called proteome scale version of such a map, and that's what I'll be talking about. But first and foremost, I want to I'd like to start by acknowledging the main contributors to this study, uh, the co-first authors, Thomas Rowland, Neil Artashan, Benoit Chaloto, Sam Pesner, Kwon Zong, Nidhi Sani, and Song Yi, and also my colleague and co-senior authors, Mike Calderwood, Dave Hill, Tong Hao, and particularly Fritz Roth, uh, without whom none of what we do in the lab would be possible. And then finally, as you see at the bottom of the slide, almost in blue, uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute, NHGRI, is providing us the, private, the primary source of funding for this work, and we want to thank them uh, very much for that. So, and by the way, the vision of NHGRI in funding this work uh, is that, you know, what I'm about to show you might actually at some point start helping better understanding 
human genetics, human diseases. And, and I want to show you that in a, a little bit more detail uh, in the next slide. So the starting point of this uh, systematic interactal mapping idea really stems first and foremost from genetics, simple genetics. You know, as you all know on this webinar, we are witnessing a, a really amazing deluge of genotypic information at the moment. Uh, with the advent of next generation sequencing and related techniques, uh, really we can, we can anticipate that most disease relevant variants in human genomes uh, will have been identified by the end of this decade. You know, in a, another five or six years, we might know really everything that matters about, about human disease in human genomes. And not, of course, this is providing crucial information for cancer research, Mendelian disorders, complex traits, etc. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, there remains an amazing challenge here, uh, which is to find the actual causal genes and the sequence variations that cause these diseases. And in addition, all this information will need to be functionalized and most importantly, contextualized relative to the complex macromolecular networks that we know now operate inside cells, um, as shown in the next slide. So it's, it's pretty clear at this point that genes and gene products uh, almost never act alone, right? So instead, they really are components of extremely complex networks, referred to as interactive networks. I have said a few times already. And these networks are formed by large numbers of physical, biochemical, and functional interactions between these components. These components. And one of the key concepts of this vision, of course, is that this, is that um, this, in the cell, you don't only have genes and gene products that have functions and properties on their own, but in addition to that, you have networks formed by genes and gene products interacting with each other that themselves exhibit properties that some people call systems properties or emergent properties that are absolutely required for a cell's biological function. And of course, various types of bio biophysical interactive networks need to be considered among which uh, today we will concentrate on protein-protein interaction networks, but uh, let's just make sure we're not forgetting about a few others. We all know, of course, that cellular networks are not only made of protein-protein interactions, but can also be made by interactions between transcription factors and, and DNA, uh, microRNA interactions in their targets, and RNA-protein interactions are also obviously fundamental to biology. So uh, the idea is that networks of interactions uh, particularly micromolecular interaction networks, as I said, underlie most genotype-phenotype relationships. That's the basic idea. And that even for relatively simple Mendelian disorders, such as cystic fibrosis, as I show on the left of this slide, uh, a full understanding of these uh, disorders uh, is complicated by uh, phenomena such as incomplete penetrance, modifier genes, variable phenotypic ex expressivity, and that all this will require really a better knowledge, again, of how these networks are organized. And then if you move towards the right uh, of the slide and going from relatively simple traits to complex traits, it becomes even uh, truer. Um, and it follows that increasingly complete and high quality maps of these networks will be needed, um, in particular uh, for complex traits. So uh, in a nutshell, um, Protein-protein uh, interactive modeling consists in, I guess, first, mapping all possible biophysical interactions uh, for an organism and analyze the properties of the resulting networks. And that's what I will spend my time doing. But obviously, this is in a context, and uh, this needs to be followed by the identification and localization of these interactions in vivo, and that's the subject of the second talk by Zhao Ling. And thirdly, of course, uh, we need downstream of that uh, functional characterization in vivo of these interactions, uh, for example, using transacting molecules or compounds, and that's what uh, Michel uh, will be uh, talking about. So um, back to the idea of systematically mapping the interactome, uh, in principle at least, uh, the problem is simple. It's really not rocket science. Uh, it's simple to conceptualize. The human interactome search space is 
made by 20,000 proteins. You probably all know that that's basically the latest number, right? We have 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. So the search space is made of 20,000 proteins by 20,000 proteins. Uh, I'm assuming one isoform per gene, and we can discuss that assumption uh, during the question session if you'd like. But even though this is simple, uh, conceptually, it also represents a huge search space, of course, of 200 million combinations of protein pairs that, uh, it need, if you want to be systematic, uh, need to be uh, tested to find possible uh, biophysical attractors. And that's obviously a pretty daunting task, right? 200 million combinations of pairs of proteins. Uh, but we think we now have a roadmap uh, to be able to get to the ultimate point, and that's what I'd like to, to discuss today. So first, uh, maybe what we should do is ask what we know about the intractome from papers published in the literature by the community of scientists. It turns out people have been looking, searching, and finding protein-protein interactions for about 20, 25 years or so, and all that information has been uh, published in the literature and, and, and curated in a, you know, half a dozen databases or something like that. Um, so basically, uh, the current estimates of the size of the human intractome, I, I don't have time to explain how we estimate the size of the human intractome. We can discuss that later. But uh, these estimates range uh, between 200,000 and 600,000 protein-protein interactions. And if you go and look at the information available in the literature, as I was just describing, uh, you find, uh, and, and, in, and if you concentrate, by the way, on demonstrably high quality uh, binary interaction information, not indirect protein-protein uh, associations, et cetera. Uh, so in terms of high quality binary direct protein-protein interactions, we have approximately 10 to 11,000 protein-protein interactions that have been described in the literature, okay? so. That's not a bad starting point, um, but it's uh, you know, more than an order of magnitude away, um, and so uh, there's something to be done here, right? So it's not a bad starting point, but there's also another problem, and that is that this information is really far from representing the real intractome homogeneously, and I want to show you what I mean by that, um, if you don't mind, in the next slide. So stay with me here. This is slightly complicated to explain. But it, what we did here is we organized the 20,000 by 20,000 gene search space that I showed a couple of slides ago. And we organized it now by ranking the genes. This is what's important. Ranking the genes in both dimensions of the search space according to the number of publications associated with each one of these genes, right? each one of the 20,000 genes. So on the x-axis, for example, just to guide you, a famous gene such as you know, P53 would be on the left side, and a completely uncharacterized gene would be on the right side. And on the y-axis, uh, both genes uh, would be at the top and bottom, respectively. I hope that's clear. So once we've organized the search space this way, what we can do then is we can go in and plot the literature protein-protein interaction data inside the space with those little squares that you see. And by the way, the intensity of blue color here indicates the density of protein-protein interactions in these squares. And so I hope that you can see uh, a huge bias in the top left corner. You know, it's as if everybody had been looking for the last 20 years, have been looking sort of under the same lamppost, um, to use a bad expression. On the right side of the search space, I hope you see that there's an apparently completely empty zone there. And we refer to that as, as the literature sparse zone. And I'll be talking a little bit about that in the next few slides. Now, that's the situation that comes out of relatively small-scale experiments. Uh, very good information, by the way, good quality, but somewhat uh, uh, biased towards that uh, then zone. So uh, does this matter, right? Could, you know, how could this hamper our understanding of human genetics, for example? Well, let me show you that in the next slide. Uh, so what we've done here. Uh, is indicating along one of the two gene axes that I was just describing, the number of genes known to be involved in cancer in that first line of, of little dots there, uh, GWAS uh, studies or complex traits in the middle one, and then Mendelian disorder in the one at the bottom, uh, if you can all see that. And, and I hope you can see that um, the spar zone from, from the, this protein-protein interaction uh, literature in, information is missing 
right? Uh, a, a huge amount of information. So that another way to put it is that uh, the, the, what's in the sparse zone uh, is at least as important for understanding human disease uh, as the dense zone is. A third way to put it is there are many, many loci involved in cancer or in complex traits or in Mendelian disorders for which there is no protein-protein interaction available at this moment from the literature. So what can be done about such biases? And that's exactly now uh, the sort of the central point of the talk. So to solve this bias, what we've been doing over the last two decades, as I said, is to, to generate a high-quality uh, reference map uh, for the full interactome network. And, and we do this by systematically assaying all 200 million combinations of protein pairs. Uh, the very, yeah, we're basically getting to 200 million combinations now. Um, and so we do this starting with this assay called the yeast 2 hybrid system, or Y2H for short. For the non-specialist, I'll just say that uh, the Y2H, uh, what it does is that it, 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 it provides an assay for protein-protein interactions by reconstituting the activity of a transcription factor in, uh, in, in yeast cells. And then uh, what we do downstream of that is that um, we basically validate that information using uh, orthogonal assays. And I'll show you the details for that in, in a couple of slides. But before we get there, I, I, we need to understand one more aspect of this so-called roadmap uh, toward a reference uh, interactome map, and that's shown in the next slide. And, and it's the fact that protein encoding open reading frames. So every time you need to study thousands, if not tens of thousands of proteins, you need to clone the open rating frames uh, with which you'll be able to express these proteins. Um, so we started doing that, and we call this the, the Orpheum cloning project, by the way. We started doing this, uh, again, about a decade ago, and uh, our first um, version uh, was <coughs> an Orpheum with about 7,000 genes represented uh, in it. And that led us to our first human interactive map in 2005, which covered a space of about you know, approximately 10% of the whole search space, right? One, if you've cloned one third of the genes, you have basically one ninth of the search space. I hope uh, everybody understands that. And then um, altogether, that gave us about 2,500 interactions represented in, in this sort of hairball looking network there. Uh, and that's about, you know, it's a little scary to look at, but it's no more than 1% of all protein-protein uh, interactions in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the full interactive network. And um, I think I have to go to the next slide. Yes, since then, uh, we've now screened another space because we, by then, we had cloned 13,000 orbs. Um, this is more recent. Uh, this uh, search space now is about half of the whole search space, as you can see in red there. And uh, that's the search space we use to generate the newest data set we call HI214. You can go online uh, uh, and, and, and download this data set. Uh, it contains about 14,000 uh, protein-protein uh, interactions. Um, so it's, it's been available for, for quite a while uh, on our website. So here's just a quick slide with too much material. I don't expect you to read all this to explain to you how we actually do, do uh, these experiments. All you need to know is uh, that we perform primary screens over tens of millions of combinations of protein pairs, as shown on the left. Then we go through a verification step in yeast, and we resequence all these pairs of proteins, and uh, the data then is uploaded on our website. And then comes the data set validation. I've said this a few times already on the right side of the site, and I'd like to go through the details of that uh, in, in the next slide now. So before uh, the release of any data set, we really assess the, the precision by validating the yeast to hybrid information using orthogonal assays. And as you can see from this slide here, the, the quality of our systematic data set shown in purple is indistinguishable from that of the literature. Uh, which is shown in blue. I hope you can see that blue and purple are right on top of each other, and much, much higher uh, than uh, our negative control, which is composed of a couple of hundred random pairs of proteins shown in red. Just to explain a little bit, the x-axis here shows you how these three assays behave across a, a range of scoring thresholds, right, with increasing stringency going towards the right side. And then uh, the y-axis shows you the fraction of, of pairs 
uh, recovered. So I hope that you can see. So in summary, uh, we have 14,000 protein-protein interactions in this data set that are similar in quality to the 11,000 interact uh, interactions available in the literature. So now, uh, what can we do with this? And one uh, of the striking observations we could make with this new data set is shown on this slide, again in purple. And that is that or this new uh, uh, systematic data set uncovers these uncharted territories in the human intractome landscape that I showed you five or ten slides ago. Uh, again, compare, if you could please, uh, purple, which is systematic, to blue, which is the information obtained um, from the literature. Okay, so uh, a question you might be asking yourself right now is, uh, why is he only talking about number of publications? And indeed, there are other ways of organizing the search space. Uh, other questions need to be asked about potential biases, which is shown on this slide. So you've seen the first column called number of publications already. Uh, please focus for a second on the second and third column. And now what we're doing is we're organizing the search space according to the overall um, expression uh, levels of all 20,000 genes in the second column, and whether or not, for example, proteins uh, are predicted to have PFAM domains, uh, and to what extent uh, their uh, the sequence is covered by PFAM domain in the third column. And I hope you can see that in all three left columns, right, the purple covers the search space much better than the blue does. Of course, uh, it's not like we're completely perfect. How could we be? Uh, there's no point of saying that. As you can see in the fourth column, that if we start looking at proteins that uh, contain transmembrane domains, uh, the literature has a, a little sparse zone there on the, on the right side, and we have one as well. So it's not like the uh, currently used assays will solve all protein-protein interactions in the intractome, uh, obviously. Okay, so <laughs> um, this is a summary of how the two types of data sets have evolved over the last 20 years. In blue, you see the literature evolving linearly in the last, like I said, you know, 20, 25 years or so. And in purple, you see 2005 and 2012 or 13 when we released uh, our newest data set. And uh, at the bottom, you can also see how the two approaches are gradually sort of, you know, quote, surfing through the search space. Uh, and, and how, you know, purple is now basically has invaded uh, most of it. So what's next? Uh, what can we do with all this? Okay, so uh, first and foremost, one note about, again, the resource that uh, is uh, the Orpheum collection. We have now collaborated with a number of colleagues in the field. We call this the, like I said, the Orpheum Collaboration, OC, and uh, we are finishing the writing of a manuscript that describes cloning of essentially almost uh, at least one or for every single one of the 20,000 human genes. This in turn, uh, we think, puts us significantly closer to our ultimate goal, which is, like I said, a reference uh, binary intractable map. And now in the last couple of years, since we produced the data set that I described to you a little bit, we've been advancing at an almost exponential uh, pace. And Mike Calderwood, who is running this project at at our center, CCSB here at Dana-Farber, uh, tells me that by the end of the year, we'll be probably at about 50,000 protein-protein uh, interactions. Um, so um, as I told you, uh, we've pretty much solved the search space uh, aspect by uh, cloning uh, all uh, genes, right, and, and being able to now express almost uh, 20,000 proteins. So what's left to be done, one slide about what we are doing in the next few years is to develop a more efficient uh, uh, set of assays to really cover most possible protein-protein interactions. Remember I told you about the problem, for example, with, me with membrane proteins. Now, as you can see quickly, on the left of the slide, uh, what you see there is a bunch of assays and uh, their recovery rate uh, of a good set of protein, really well-known, well-described, well-demonstrated protein-protein interactions. And none of the assays that are available today uh, detects much more than 30 to 40 percent of high-quality uh, interactions. But as you can see, I hope, on the right side, um, because these assays do not all identify the exact same pairs, 
uh, if we combine the assays, the more we use the, these assays, and the more we reach saturation of the entire uh, intractable network. So in summary, we think that altogether, we'll need uh, to probably do about 20 screening attempts with different assays throughout the entire 20K by 20K that I just described. And the news is that we think we will be able to accomplish this by 2020. So we jokingly refer to this uh, project as 2020 by 20 by 2020. Anyway, so five years ahead, uh, we might have a better sense of something that will be uh, not completely done, but um, uh, nearly uh, so. All right. And if I may, I'll use just one more minute um, here to go back to our original question. Um, what can we do with this information? Um, so, well, we think that this type of information uh, might be able to transform the way we understand human genetics. And to sort of go to summarize it crudely from like a phone book type of model where, you know, we consider lists of genes involved in different diseases to a more network-based Facebook uh, view of the, of the problem. And I just will uh, use two slides uh, to uh, try to exemplify that uh, for you. So here we asked a very simple question. Uh, do candidate uh, genes that lie in cancer GWAS loci, those are GWAS loci that appear to be associated with higher cancer susceptibility, uh, do these uh, genes uh, tend to interact with very well-known cancer gene products if we look at the intractome network uh, that we obtained uh, recently and I just described? And uh, I hope uh, you can see from here uh, that uh, we definitely see a significant uh, link or set of links uh, between candidate cancer genes on the left and known cancer genes on the right when we use the purple information, the systematic intractome uh, network map that I just uh, described. And I think uh, this is it. I know the last vignette is very short, but I just want to summarize by telling you that uh, we've generated a proteome scale map of the human intractome network. And I hope I convince you that such systematic maps uh, might become uh, crucial information to understand uh, networks and diseases in general, and that, that might help us starting to connect the dots of the human genetics revolution. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vidal. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Shaolin Nan. Dr. Nan received his BS and MS in chemistry from Peking University, Beijing, and a PhD in biophysics from Harvard University. His graduate studies focused on wet chemistry approaches to fabricating aligned single wall carbon nanotubes and the biophysical analysis of dynamic processes in living cells using high time resolution, spatial precision, and chemical selectivity strategies. As a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Stephen Chu at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Joe Gray at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and Dr. Frank McCormick at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Nan established a unique biological system for controlled expression of tagged proteins for single molecule counting and localization using super-resolution imaging based on POM and STORM principles. He investigated the oncogenic processes and intracellular trafficking of RAS GTP dimer formation and RAF activation. Dr. Nan joined the Oregon Health and Science University Department of Biomedical Engineering as an assistant professor in June 2012. He is also a member of the OHSU Center for Spatial Systems Biomedicine and an associate member of the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute. Acknowledging the promise of his work as a young, young innovative cancer, free, cancer researcher, Dr. Nan was named a Damon Runyon Ratcliffe Innovative Investigator in 2013 by the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation. Dr. Nan? Hi, uh, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, uh, Susan and Kylie for inviting me to this presentation, and it's a really gr great pleasure to be here to share with you some of the recent work uh, that we have been doing on imaging protein-protein interactions at the single molecule and nanometer scales by combining uh, the well-known BIFC or bimolecular fluorescence complementation techniques and um, the POM or photoactivated localization microscopy technique. So. Uh, as we just heard from um, Mark, the global view of the protein-protein interactions in the form of a interactome would be a powerful 
uh, tool for studying biology uh, and that provides a 10,000 feet uh, view of what's happening in a biological system. And, but at times, uh, many of us would wish to study a specific protein interaction um, at uh, greater details, in greater details, uh, ideally at the molecular level. So in my lab, we're primarily focused on uh, the interactions between uh, the small GTPase RAS and uh, its effector molecules, including the RAS kinase, PI3 kinase, and some other effectors. So, and we study these protein interactions uh, with a, a class of techniques called, um, called single molecule localization microscopy, or uh, better known as the super resolution fluorescence microscopy, which uh, many of you might have uh, known was the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, last year. So, um, very briefly, the way that uh, single molecule localization imaging techniques work is instead of having all the fluorescent molecules in your sample emitting at the same time, which would result in a diffraction limited image as you would normally get, um, and also shown as the bottom right uh, confocal image. Um, uh, Instead, what we do in the single molecule localization uh, microscopy experiments is to uh, generate a situation where the molecules um, are mostly turned off and they can, um, through a stochastic uh, activation uh, or switching process, individual molecules can be switched on and emit fluorescence. So uh, as shown and on the top panel, what you would be looking at it would be a random subset of molecules blinking on uh, in each individual frame, and these molecules will be subsequently photo bleached, and a new subset of molecules are randomly activated and emitting fluorescence. So, therefore, you're isolating all these densely labeled fluorescent molecules uh, in time, and so that you can I you can localize them uh, each individual molecule precisely in space. So, after acquiring all these uh, individual frames, uh, we go to the data processing, processing step and identify the uh, fluorescent spots, which correspond to individual fluorescent molecules, and um, do a some kind of a fitting. In this case, it would be a 2D Gaussian fitting to the intensity profile of each individual molecule that you uh, observe through the acquisition process, and uh, through which we can then determine the centroid location of that single molecule with much better precision uh, than the diffraction limit, uh, typically around 250 nanometers. So, uh, and the confidence in determining the centroid would be inversely proportional to the number of, uh, to the square root of the number of photons that you detect for that for that specific molecule. So, in theory, if you collect 100 photons from a molecule then you can localize it down to about 25 nanometers of precision. So that's how uh, this uh, single molecule localization process can improve the resolution. So after your experiment, you put all the coordinates um, together and reconstruct a high resolution uh, image. So that's shown here as the uh, palm image uh, of microtubule network labeled with PM Cherry one we're getting around 20 nanometers of spatial resolution. So, as you can see, this process involves imaging single molecules. So we get both the spatial resolution as well as, in um, specific cases, the counting uh, precision of single mo down to single molecules. So that allowed us to study the RAS and RAS signaling processes using. Um, very fine details down to the single molecule and nanometer scales, for example, and there is some very interesting biology revealed by imaging uh, RAS and RAF kinase uh, using the palm technique. So uh, what I show here is that some uh, palm images of RAS showing uh, dimers as indicated by the arrow, and these dimers were found to be responsible for activation of RAF mod k pathway, and at the same time when RAF is activated by the RAS GTPase, they are also found to form dimers in occasionally higher order structures on the cell membrane. And look at the scale bar. Um, it's 250 nanometers, and each dot represents just one fluorescently tagged RAS or RAS molecules. So 
Based on these results, we've proposed a new uh, dimer model for RAS and RAF signaling in which um, uh, two copies of RAF molecules, both GTP bound, would each recruit a RAF molecule and upon dimerization of RAF, it brings two copies of the RAF kinase into close proximity, which is known to activate um, is to activate the RAF kinase and subsequently the RAF the map case signaling pathway. So I'm having a little bit of a difficulty here. Um, I'm not seeing my slides anymore. So at so, the moment, we're on the slide, a dimer model of RAS RAS signaling. If you want to try and refresh your browser. OK. And see if that refreshes. Yes, it's doing um, right. It's refreshing, and it's showing up. OK, great. Thank you. So, Thank you. Sure. Um, so this is a new model. Um, of RAS RAF signaling that contrasts the model that you define in the cancer textbook. And um, so, and it predicts that in a single RAS RAF signaling complex, you would have two copies of RAS and two copies of RAF molecules, which have never been shown. Um, so, we wanted to investigate this, uh, to test this hypothesis, this, this prediction. And the first approach, of course, that would come to mind is that why. Uh, we could do to color a quantitative poem and be able to count uh, the number of RAF molecules and the RAF molecules into channels, uh, both at the single molecule level. And but there is a practical reason why this has not been done um, in the red channel, which is the PM Cherry One channel. We can get very good quantitative imaging capabilities uh, for POM, but there is the fluorophores or fluorescent proteins in the green channel do not yet exist. Uh, that would offer similar uh, performance to PM Cherry One in terms of quantitative palm imaging. So, uh, by necessity, we had to resort to some other approaches to test this hypothesis. And the approach that we decided to use um, is biomolecular fluorescence complementation, or BIFC, so which has been used to study protein protein interactions um, in cells and um, for a number of advantages. So, because it's genetically tag, uh, encoded, so that you can express your proteins uh, in cells and uh, be able to visualize uh, the protein-protein interactions uh, with the fluorescent signal and even in live cells. So, the principle of IFC is very straightforward. So, you take a fluorescent protein um, and split it into two halves at a specific size, typically, and uh, neither fragment is going to be fluorescent because you just broke uh, you just broke the uh, chromophore. That each fragment would then be tagged or genetically fused to a protein of interest that you're suspecting is interacting with uh, another protein. And when the interaction between the two candidate proteins uh, are actually taking place, that will bring the two fragments of uh, fragments back into proximity, which then can have a chance to reform the complete fluorescent protein and therefore giving rise to this um, fluorescent signal. So this has been used over and over again in studying protein, protein interactions in living cells, despite some limitations that I will come, come back to later at the end of my talk. So um, we thought, well, maybe this could be combined with uh, POM because bias, both BIFC and POM techniques would um, use fluorescent proteins, uh, except that POM is gonna require um, a photoactivatable fluorescent protein. Uh, in this case, uh, we have been using PM Cherry One, and by accident, we found the, a previous a publication where a group um, had split the parent protein for PM Cherry One, uh, which is M Cherry, um, for BIFC purposes. And they have specifically identified a site within the uh, M Cherry protein at uh, residue 159, meaning that if you split um, the residues uh, 159 and 160 uh, and attached to, to interacting proteins, you will have a good bias signal when there's protein interactions. Um, so, and uh, we compared M cherry with PAM cherry um, amino acid sequence and found that uh, around this region, the, the M cherry and the PAM cherry proteins are uh, pretty much identical. And 
we further looked at having a lack here as well uh, again so something apologies for the delay so I'm uh, having some difficulty viewing my slides <clears throat> Do you want to try and refresh your browser again? Uh, yes, I just yeah, I just did. Um, let me go back to that particular slide. Right. We further looked at uh, the crystal structure of the M cherry, um, and found that this site should be located at uh, the periphery of the chromophore uh, between beta barrel seven and eight. So therefore, it's a safe site to split uh, uh, without affecting the ability for the two fragments to come back together. Um, for uh, in a biopsy process. So, uh, and the same site has been used for other fluorescent proteins uh, for bio biopsy applications. So, uh, with that, we're confident that uh, this site uh, might be suitable for generating a biopsy pair uh, using PAM cherry. So, we designed an experiment where we tagged uh, the two fragments of PAM cherry split at 159 um, residue and um, attached each fragment to a artificial heterodimerized dimer, uh, dimerization system, uh, which consists of two peptide sequences. One is dimer A, the other is dimer C. In this case, dimer A happens to be attached to uh, the membrane after synthesis. And then uh, we can induce the interaction between dimer A and dimer C by a small molecule heterodimerizer. Uh, and when that happens, we help to see a complete PM cherry one formation uh, uh, reformed and uh, giving rise to uh, fluorescent signal. So, and that's exactly what we saw. So, when we uh, we created multiple different multiple pairs be between uh, for the fusion between dimer the uh, the heterodimers uh, system and the uh, PM cherry fragments. And before you add the heterodimerizer, there's no interaction between the dimer A, dimer C units. So therefore, you don't have any PM fluorescence from PM cherry one. But as soon as you add heterodimerizers to the uh, to the uh, cultural medium after within a few hours, you would start to see the fluorescence building up uh, in the cells, and uh, and this fluorescence signal is uh, is pretty strong in two of the four pairs that we have tested. And what we have found also very encouraging is that um, uh, in contrast to other biopsy pairs, uh, PM cherry biopsy showed good maturation at 37 degrees, meaning that you can get very good fluorescent signal even if you incubate the cells at 37 degrees. Others would require incubation at 25 or 4 degrees, which can be de detrimental to the cells. And there is very low background from spontaneous interactions here, meaning before you add the heterodimerizer. So, and uh, we, uh, using this heterodimer system, we optimized the split site to be, uh, again, at uh, site 159, and other sites are possible, but they give a much weaker biopsy uh, signal upon the protein-protein um, interaction. So, now we have a good uh, biopsy system based on PM cherry one but in order to, for use, uh, in order, um, to use this system for Palm imaging, uh, so that we can study protein interactions at single molecule and nanometer scales. Uh, we also have to make sure that the, the PM cherry one fluorophores regenerated through the biopsy process would retain some of the physical photophysical properties of the original PM cherry one. Uh, specifically, we want the single molecules of uh, biopsy PM cherry one to be as bright uh, as the original PM cherry one, which is, is the case uh, as shown on the left panels. Um, so where each bright dot would represent one PM cherry molecule. And in the middle panel, the, if you compare quantitatively how many photons are emitted on average by each PM cherry molecule, they're also similar. And the localization precisions uh, are also similar between the two um, uh, proteins. So that gave us confidence that we can now uh, realize both biopsy and use the biopsy general uh, PM cherry molecules for uh, palm imaging. So, and that's uh, exactly what we did. So, when you add the heterodimerizers uh, to induce the dimer A, dimer C hetero uh, uh, protein pairs and regenerate the PM cherry one, we can then 
to the same single molecule localization experiment as I showed you in the second slide, and be able to localize where the individual pairs of dimer A, dimer C are located uh, in the cell. So here I'm showing a palm image taken uh, with under total internal reflection uh, illumination conditions so that we are only looking at the basal membrane of the cell. And each dot will now instead uh, will now represent a pair of dimer RA, dimer C complex. And um, so you can zoom in and um, look at where each um, dimer RA, dimer C complex is and be able to uh, resolve the, look, the um, spatial locations of these complexes at around 18 nanometers uh, spatial resolution again. So all these structural details will be totally lost if you do just regular turf or confocal type of measurement. So, uh, um, at this point, we have already demonstrated the principles of biopsy palm. So the next thing that we have done is to look at RAS-RAS interactions with biopsy palm. So in this case, we designed a slightly different experiment. So we uh, RAS goes to uh, the membrane by itself after through some post-translational modifications, and that's attached to one of the fragments. And RAF, in this case, we're only using the RAS binding domain of RAF. Or the N-termini, uh, or about 50 amino acids of RAF on the N-terminus, um, and by uh, genetically fusing RAF and RAF to these fragments, we transfected the cells uh, with these two fragments and expressed so that they can be expressed. And then we looked at the interactions between the uh, RAF and RAF RBD. Um, and um, so, as shown on the right. We can get a very high resolution map of where the individual RAS and RBD complexes are. Um, and the resolution here again is around 18 nanometers. And each dot in this uh, zoom image is on uh, the left would represent one RAS and R one RBD complex instead of a, just a RAS or just a RAF molecule. So, and this again, the structural details would be. Uh, washed out and if you do regular conventional turf or confocal type of measurement. So uh, to make sure that uh, we're looking at the specific interactions between RAS and RAF, we have also done mutagenesis on the RAF kinase, uh, specifically a, a mutation of the ARM89 residue would um, uh, disrupt the interaction between RAS and RAF. And when we do that, we get much reduced um, biopsy signal as compared with the wild type, here a wild type means uh, uh, the original RAF uh, uh, RBD sequence. So that confirms that uh, the interactions that we're looking at was due to specific interactions uh, between RAS and RAF and not be, uh, be between the two fragments of PM Cherry 1. And more uh, importantly, what we have found in a thorough analysis of the palm images of RAS and RBD by FC is that we saw uh, again and again this dimer complexes on the cell membrane, and now each dimer complex would represent a um, RAS dimer plus um, a um, RAF dimer, although only the RBD uh, domain of RAF is uh, used in this uh, in this study, and that further the appearance of the dimers is further uh, confirmed by of the cluster analysis. So up to this point, um, what we can conclude from, from uh, these images is that um, uh, the RAS RAF complexes can further um, dimerize and to form this tetrameric complex. So we're working on uh, uh, the RAS, the interactions between RAS and full length RAF to fully elucidate uh, or reveal the uh, existence of RAS RAF dimers on the cell membrane. So that's in the works. So, and another thing that we could do is to do the single molecule tracking in live cells um, and see how the individual RAS RAF complexes move on the membrane. So, and um, so this is again enabled by the palm uh, uh, technique through observation of the individual fluorescent molecules that happen to balloon Kong at the moment and so every time a molecule blink on, blinks on, you can then follow it for a fraction of a second and be able to compute the diffusion trajectory or diffusion constant of that particular molecule here 
uh, would uh, each fluorescent spot would be a rough rough complex. So through this experiment, we identified that there is at least uh, three different populations of rough rough complex, and some are very mobile. Um, so uh, which would be the population three? They have a diffusion constant of about a half a micron square per second, and some uh, complexes can be com almost completely immobile. So um, that means that the complexes are experiencing interactions with some or some some other uh, structures on the cell membrane, and um, so we're performing subsequent uh, follow-up experiments to figure out what exactly that means in terms of biology. So, uh, and we're using the uh, interaction to study other um, protein interactions, for example, the ras ras interactions, which also give rise to a strong bias signal in our system, and as well as HER2 and HER3 uh, interactions in breast cancer. Um, we're also starting to look at BEC RAF uh, interactions, heterodimerization, in, uh, which is important in the context of the melanoma. Um, so I've shown you an example uh, of biopsy palm using PM cherry ones, um, and clearly we're not the, the only group who has thought of, about this. And um, in the same year, 2014, there are two other groups published uh, the biopsy palm uh, experiments uh, using different uh, follow switchable or follow activatable uh, fluorescent proteins. Uh, one uses uh, split PA GFP. Um, I couldn't figure out where exactly they did the split. Uh, and the other one is for splitting MUOS 3.2 at site 164. Uh, our experience is that uh, this is a very good uh, biopsy pair for super resolution imaging in bacteria. Um, so I uh, at the last, at the end of my talk, I want to uh, talk about briefly the limitations of BIFC uh, approaches, uh, BIFC. Uh, it's commonly known that BIFC uh, process is re irreversible, meaning that once the chromophores are formed, they cannot go back to the individual fragments. Therefore, the interactions that we're looking at using the BIFC approach, including the BIFC palm approach, would be um, uh, uh, all the floor force we look at would be preformed uh, from a few hours ago. Um, so that can pose some limitations in studying the dynamics of the interactions. So we have to be uh, aware of this limitation when trying to design experiments and uh, uh, interpret the uh, experimental results. So, but over and over again, as we can see from the literature, BIFC um, can authentically report location of uh, protein protein interactions in, in most cases. And there's some efforts on designing a reversible BIFC pair, um, and uh, as well as using some alternative strategies, for example, FRET or other, some other principles for detecting protein-protein uh, protein interactions in a uh, non- uh, or less invasive way. So, with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Um, I hope I have convinced you that uh, BIFC palm is a useful technique for studying protein protein interactions, the nanometer and single molecule scales. And uh, we have done some interesting biology with BIFC palm uh, relating to the RAS RAS signaling uh, dimer model. Um, so, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the people who have done the work and my collaborators um, at UCSF and Stanford and um, my funding. Sources. And again, thank you all for your attention, and um, uh, and Susan and Katie again for inviting me to give the talk. Thank you, Dr. Nan. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Michelle Arkin. Dr. Arkin is the Associate Director of the Small Molecule Discovery Center and an Associate Professor at UCSF. Her research is focused on modulating biological processes with small molecules with particular interest in inhibition of protein-protein interactions and modulating allosterically regulated enzyme complexes. Dr. Arkin completed her PhD in chemistry in Jackie Barton's lab at Caltech and a postdoctoral fellowship in Jim Wells' lab at Genentech. She was among the first scientists at Sunesis Pharmaceuticals and was Associate Director of Cell Biology before moving to UCSF in 2007. Dr. Arkin? Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to Susan and Kaylee for the invitation. Um, it's really fun to be here and to hear Mark and Shaolin's talks as well. So today I'm going to talk about um, 
going from, we went from proteomics to cell, and now we're going to the very molecular level, talking about site-directed ligand discovery for protein-protein interactions. So now that we know what protein complexes we want to inhibit, how do we go about doing that? So first of all, what are the challenges? Why are they considered, protein-protein interactions, considered difficult targets? And are there ways that we can get around this? So here's a typical protein-protein interaction, or say a prototypical protein-protein interaction. We have interleukin-2 in gray and interleukin-2 receptor alpha chain in yellow ribbon. And you see that the interface between the two, shown in green, is large and uses several regions of protein secondary structure. And these are the features uh, that several years ago got people thinking that this was going to be a difficult target class to inhibit. So first of all, as we saw uh, in the first talk, there are thousands of protein-protein interactions, and these fall into several diverse structural classes. So you might also say that even if we do crack the problem for one protein-protein interaction, it's a sense thousands of orphan targets, unlike, say, kinases. Once we crack that problem, it was very scalable to other kinases. Another challenge is that from looking at this crystal structure of this extracellular protein hormone uh, receptor interaction, we see interfaces that are flat and large compared to drugged target classes. So it may be small molecules aren't going to be able to fit uh, aren't going to find a foothold in these sites and that maybe the molecules would be too small to inhibit the whole interface. But over time, okay, and then another problem that um, as people did start to find compounds that inhibited protein-protein interfaces, these inhibitors tended to be outside of what we would call drug-like space or Lipinski space. So that rather than being smaller than 500 Daltons and log Ps of less than five, they tended to be on the larger side, 400 to six or 700 Daltons, maybe more hydrophobic, more complex molecules. And so even if we could get inhibitors of protein-protein complexes, could we get drugs out of them? So then as data started to emerge and we start to put together the data that, that has emerged on chemical biology and drug discovery for these kinds of interfaces, we learned several things that say not all protein interfaces are alike. So first of all, when you look at many protein-protein complexes now, you'll see that um, they, are, they fall into different structural classes, and some appear to be more druggable than others. We'll follow that more on the next slide. But in general, small interfaces and tight binding interfaces tend to be more druggable. So you might think that the tight interface is more druggable because there's more, say, thermodynamic juice in the system. Uh, there's more binding energy to be had there for a small molecule. Okay, then to the large and flat interface question. Mutagenesis studies on many complexes have found that there are binding hotspots that form a subset of the interface but confer most of the binding affinity. So even though those interfaces might be large, not every uh, atomic interaction is equally important and that those interactions that are important tend to be a smaller piece of the interface next to each other. So there's a core interface and maybe all, we only need to inhibit that core interface to be successful. Uh, and then when thinking about compounds that are outside Lipinski space, there has been progress in making those kinds of compounds. And, and interestingly, when you see what's successful in the literature, often there are peptides, peptidomimetics, macrocycles that interact with these kinds of interfaces. And then on the other side of the scale, so those would be larger molecules. And then on the other side of the scale, there's been a lot of success using fragment-based drug discovery. So very small molecules, much smaller than the size of a drug. Uh, and then uh, recently now we have some clinical stage compounds. There are about, say, 10 targets that have compounds that are going into the clinic um, that inhibit protein-protein interactions. And these recent clinical stage compounds actually tend to fall closer to typical drug-like space. So some of this idea that inhibitors have to be outside drug-like space might have um, might be true in some cases, and in other cases might be a function of just needing to do more medicinal chemistry to get those molecules as efficient and small as possible. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of different structural classes of proteins, so we categorize them into three different structural classes. Primary, where we have a relatively simple epitope, where one side of the protein complex epitope can be mapped down to, say, one or two residues, BRD4, the bromo domains, fall into this class where they are protein-protein interfaces, but you can narrow the binding affinity really down to one or two residues, so relatively low complexity. 
Then a, a much large, a very large class of protein, protein complexes, especially for intracellular targets, rely on secondary structure. So these secondary interfaces use a small piece of peptide from one side of the interface, either a linear peptide or an alpha helix or a loop. Here's an example with MDM2 in gray binding to P53 in yellow. And the whole binding affinity of the protein-protein complex can be recapitulated by this one piece of secondary structure from one side. So this winds up being, say, the second least complex. And then the most complex, again, is an example like interleukin-2, maybe more common in extracellular protein complexes where you have large regions of secondary structure and tertiary structure that's required from one or both sides of the interface in order to make that interaction. So you can imagine from a design perspective, something that starts off as a small single amino acid or a small region of secondary structure might be easier to design a mimetic than something that requires a large piece of tertiary structure. And in fact, when you look at what inhibitors have been developed and have been advanced towards clinical trials, the simpler the epitope is, the more inhibitors we have. So when we're thinking about this problem, we wonder, okay, so there's some complexity of the inter different kinds of interfaces. So to some extent, drugability is going to be a target problem. And then on the other hand, drugability might also be a methodology problem. So what methodologies can we use to approach this problem? And the method that we used is called fragment-based lead discovery. And I think many people in the audience will be familiar with this now. If you um, sort of to take it at the highest level, if you look on the left-hand side, you have a protein that looks like an orange cloud with a complex binding site, say a protein-protein at one side of a protein interface. And if you try to bind a library of compounds, say a, lar a library of large or drug-sized compounds that have a number of different R groups, a number of different pharmacophores in that compound, then you'll find that some parts of the molecule will bind tightly and other parts will not bind well or not bind at all. And so for a complex surface, it's difficult to make a complex molecule and perfectly match that complementarity right off the bat. If, on the other hand, you just start with the little pieces themselves, the fragments that are half or less than half the size of a drug, and you try to bind those to the target, they'll bind more weakly because there are fewer interactions that they're making, but they'll bind more efficiently because there's less stuff that's not binding well. And then the idea is in the next step, you would find these pieces, and then you would connect these pieces to find a drug size molecule. So some advantages to this technology in principle are that we can sample larger diversity. Smaller molecules scope out a smaller diversity space. We also focus chemistry then on pieces that are pre-selected for binding. So we have maybe a more efficient chemistry uh, advancement procedure. And we're also selecting for high ligand efficiency. So one of the challenges of medicinal chemistry is taking a molecule, uh, making it bind tighter without making it much bigger, because the bigger the molecule gets, the more opportunities there are for it to do something that you don't want it to do when they get into a patient. Okay. Uh, another practical matter that I think makes fragment discovery a very valuable technique is that they tend to use binding-based methods rather than functional assays. So there we're selecting for binding of a fragment to the protein, uh, we have usually higher resolution assays. We can select for binding stoichiometry as well as binding affinity, so our number of artifacts is low, say, compared to high throughput screening. And also, we don't require a functional assay. So the technology that we've been using that I'm going to talk about today is called tethering or disulfide trapping. And this technology was developed at Sinesis Pharmaceuticals, and we're now doing it at UCSF. So this technology is a site-directed fragment approach where you take a cysteine residue that's near the binding site you're interested in. It's either engineered or it's a native cysteine residue. We mix it with a library of disulfides under conditions that favor silate disulfide exchange. And then in equilibrium, we find those compounds here shown as a blue circle that bind to the protein, make non-covalent binding interactions with the protein, and also have the proper geometry to make that disulfide bond. We visualize those hits by mass spectrometry. And here's an example where a compound is tethering to a cysteine residue in a small subunit of a two-domain protein, as you see from that shift in mass, and not binding at all to the large subunit, which you see from the, the um, 18,000 well, uh, 18, Dalton mass. So some advantages of the technique are that we have a positive detection signal since it's mass spectrometry. We're not looking for inhibition but for binding. The fact that the method is site-directed allows us to predict the binding region. It also facilitates uh, structural biology, 
So crystallography is still a really important methodology for advancing fragments into lead-like molecules. So uh, I got interested in this technology when I was working on interleukin-2 at Synesis. And we had some compounds here schematized in green that had micromolar affinity for the protein interface. And they were basically two pharmacophores, two pieces of two binding elements attached to each other, and just all the medicinal chemistry wasn't getting us to a tighter compound. So we reasoned that perhaps there was a binding site near there that we just weren't accessing. And so we used the tethering approach to find a fragment here shown in orange that was nearby that binding site, and then we sought to link it in a second step. Here's the crystal structure of an example of that green molecule, and then a model, not a crystal structure, but a model of fragments that came out of this tethering screen shown in yellow. Uh, so when we uh, look at this model, it's very clear that we can take this fragment here, it's a salicylic acid, and attach it to the para-carbon uh, uh, para of the long um, starting material. And when we did that, we made a small library of these small acids two carbons away from that phenyl ring, and we found a number of molecules that bound now in the submicromolar range. So this technology was able to rapidly get us a new pharmacophore into a new chemical space that medicinal chemistry just wasn't quite able to access. So this is one of the earlier type binding compounds for a protein-protein interface, um, for an extracellular protein in particular. So now we have um, several crystal structures of interleukin-2, and we had several of our, our hits that bound to interleukin-2. And as we uh, looked at these structures, we found some things that wound up being very generalizable. So you find that inhibitors can access alternate conformations of the protein. I'm just going to click through a couple of different conformations of the protein that we see by crystallography and call your attention to the light gray residues. These are the residues that are going to move the most. So here as we bind one of our micromolar inhibitors, we see some shifts down on the right-hand side of the molecule, and then some minor shifts on the left-hand side of the molecule in this long loop that's shown in light gray, and a phenylalanine residue that sits underneath the linker in between these two pharmacophores. It, it rolls down, I'll go back and forth. You can see that the residue right in the middle of the screen rolls down to create a platform for the compound. Then when we add that third pharmacophore, we get another rearrangement where the, uh, the loop of the protein seems to bind around this small molecule. Molecular dynamic simulations and many simulations that have been done since suggest that these compounds bind to low energy conformations that are present in the conformational ensemble. So protein complexes or protein interfaces can be thought of as being a little bit molten or a little bit adaptive, and compounds don't necessarily need to bind to the same conformation that they bind to in the protein-protein complex. The crystal structure of interleukin-2 bound to its receptor came out a couple years later, and comparing these two uh, interfaces is very instructive also. For time, I'll just note quickly that if you see an orange, the, that's the structural interface, or the residues that contact in the left, the alpha chain of the receptor, and in the right, the small molecule. The orange space is much larger in the protein-protein interaction than in the protein-small molecule interaction but in red are shown the hotspot residues. So these are the residues that contribute most of the binding affinity to both the protein-protein interaction and the protein-small molecule interaction. So compounds not only use the same binding site, but they also tend to use the same hotspot residues, and the protein conformation adapts to match the binding partner, either the small molecule or the protein. So some generalizable lessons for protein-protein interaction inhibitors, that small molecules use these hotspot residues. Uh, they tend to mimic the types of interactions, so hydrophobe to hydrophobe, but not the backbone or even the orientation of those residues. So designing a small molecule inhibitor from a protein-protein complex need, be, need not be so literal. It's more the principles and less the geometries. Uh, protein conformation adapts to afford deeper binding sites for small molecules. So in most of the known cases where a small molecule binds at a protein interface and we also have the protein-protein complex structure, we see that there are small changes in the protein interface that lead to deeper pockets that a molecule can slip into and bind more efficiently. Fragments have also been found to probe these adaptive and, and potentially allosteric regions of proteins particularly well, perhaps because they're small. 
Uh, and these kinds of adaptive and allosteric interactions are particularly common in signal transduction enzymes. So I'm going to talk now about a kinase example. Uh, this is the kinase PDK1. And it's known that there's an allosteric site in the end lobe of PDK1. Here it's called the PIF pocket. And that PIF pocket has two functions. It serves when a protein, say a substrate, when a PDK1 protein substrate binds to PDK1 in that pocket, it allosterically activates the kinase and also co-localizes the protein substrate with the enzyme. So two functions, both co-localization and activation. Not all of the substrates of PDK1 use this PIF pocket. So you could imagine inhibiting uh, binding to the PIF pocket might give you some selectivity in which substrates are being inhibited. And uh, interestingly, the peptides, so the peptides derived from these protein-peptide interactions, are activators. So as the whole protein activates the kinase, so does just the isolated peptide. So Jack Sadowski, who was a postdoc in Jim Wells' lab at UCSF, wanted to see if we could use tethered fragments to mimic this peptide interaction. So taking an inactive kinase on the left into an active kinase by binding a fragment in the PIF pocket. So he made a series of cysteine mutations around that protein-peptide interaction site, crossed it with a number of small molecules, and interestingly found that at each one of these sites, he could get both inhibitors and activators of the kinase activity towards a peptide substrate. So get, solving the crystal structures of some of these fragments, we found that you could activate the enzyme. Here the C helix at the bottom of the crystal structures. This is the regulatory helix. And this helix points towards the active site, pushes catalytic residues into the active site when the enzyme's active. And that's the function of the peptide. So small molecules tethered at a single site can do that same function, mimic the peptide pushing the C helix towards the active site and activate the enzyme, but also using different molecular interactions, particularly smaller molecules, could hold the C helix away from the active site, leading to inhibitors. So you can have allosteric activators or inhibitors or neutral binders at the same site. So this is an advantage of thinking about tethering for potential allosteric sites. You don't necessarily want to measure function in the first place because a neutral binder can be turned into an activator by adding more interaction to it or specific interactions. So um, we use tethering here to function the way the protein complexes function, to uh, allosterically regulate the enzyme, and you could imagine that these would inhibit the co-localization function towards a total protein, a whole protein that required that peptide interaction to be activated. So small molecules that interfere with these, such complexes offer new approaches to inhibiting signal transduction enzymes, even druggable enzymes like kinases. So in just the last couple of minutes, I'll just talk about another type of target that we've looked at um, using cysteine proteases now. Uh, proteases, I'm cheating a little bit, but proteases are kind of like protein-protein interactions that do chemistry. So two proteins come together, and one of them clips the other one into two pieces. Uh, and this caspases are very interesting and involved in lots of important biology, and we'd love to have small molecule inhibitors, uh, drugs, or chemical probes to target specific caspases, but that's been very difficult to do. So here's a canonical peptide substrate that binds to a caspase, and the cysteine residue attacks where the arrow points and separates the peptide into two pieces. And most known inhibitors contain the features of this peptide. They contain an acid in the P1 site. You see there's an aspartic acid. So most inhibitors bind to the, to the site that binds the acid, <clears throat> and they covalently modify the catalytic cysteine. So because the primary recognition elements and the primary chemistry elements are in common for the whole family of caspases, it's been very difficult to get highly selective chemical tools and drugs to target a given caspase. So we set out uh, using a different way into the active site, and notice that there's a cysteine residue on this loop that points towards the active site. Now, the uh, peptide that binds in the active site is shown here in magenta. And the cysteine residue is unique to caspase 6. It's a serine and related caspases. So this could give us a selectivity handle to find fragments that bound to this site pointed <coughs> excuse me, into the active site but only to caspase 6. <coughs> 
And in fact, when we found those fragments, we did see impressive selectivity. Uh, and if you make <clears throat> the cysteine mutation on cast phases three, for example, or seven, you don't get tethering to that site. So the fragment isn't only recognizing the cysteine residue, but also making specific molecular interactions that are specific for cast phase six. These fragments have some nice properties. They inhibit the cleavage of peptides. Uh, when you add them to cell lysates, you add caspase 6 to a cell lysate, for example. Tau is a very interesting substrate of caspase 6 involved in tauopathies and Alzheimer's disease. And we can show here that if you um, add caspase 6, you cleave tau. If you then add the compounds, they bind to caspase 6 and inhibit tau cleavage. And you also see in cells, if you selectively activate caspase 6 using this sniper system, we now have a selective activation of caspase 6, add the fragments to cells, and get inhibition of caspase 6 activity. So now just to summarize, um, where does site-directed screening, site-directed tethering help us with challenging targets? So to go to protein-protein interactions as a class, uh, we agree that they're difficult targets, but they're not necessarily undruggable targets. Some of the things that uh, make us think that they are druggable targets, include this idea that protein dynamics allow us to have binding pockets that are not necessarily seen in the protein-protein interaction, so we can't necessarily design targets, but having a site-directed discovery technology uh, gives us a handle for, for finding fragments, finding compounds that bind to these difficult sites. And we've shown that protein-protein interaction sites and enzymes that co-localize substrates and allosterically modulate activity are particularly good sites for tethering. Uh, so tethering itself has a number of applications in protein-protein interaction discovery and inhibitor discovery. Tethering captures specific protein conformations, so that allows us to bind to non-conserved cysteines to get selectivity, as we showed with caspase 6. Uh, in two projects I didn't have a chance to talk about, uh, we can see that, pro that uh, cysteine residues, this RAS example, uh, has an oncogenic cysteine residue, and um, Hei von Schokat's lab found fragments through tethering that bound to this oncogenic residue, uh, exposing a cryptic site and inhibiting just that uh, oncogenic allele of RAS. We've also found that because binding interactions stabilize a protein, you can use tethering-derived small molecules to stabilize proteins uh, and to crystallize proteins such as transcription factor domains that had been too flexible to crystallize in the past. And, uh, and a math lab published the first crystal structure of Kix domain using tethering. Now it just remains to thank the people who did the work on these projects, the interleukin-2 receptor project at Sinesis Pharmaceuticals, the PDK-1 allosteric site project uh, spearheaded by Jack Sadowski at UCSF, and the CASPA-6 project um, the people who passed in future, people who've been working on this project are shown. And thank you for your attention. Pass it back to Susan now for questions. Thank you, Dr. Arkin. Quite a few questions have come in, so let's get started with our Q&A session. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Vidal. For the reference interactome map, is it possible to find detailed information of the amino acid content for all clones for a given gene used? it's possible that different domains of a protein will have different interactions. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Sure. I, mean, um, I think the first question was, I'm not sure I understood the first question terribly well. So it, it, do, do we have the information on the amino acid sequence of the Content. proteins that we're using? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, that's... that's that's yes. The answer is yes. Uh, come to our website. If you have a problem, email us. All the email addresses are right there. If you Google my name and CCSB, you should be able to find it easily. Center for Cancer Systems Biology, CCSB. Um, and so the second question, yes. Uh, and I guess Michelle uh, 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 touched on that a few times. Uh, proteins are very dynamic objects. Um, I, if you remember, I said we need to assume one isoform per gene, which obviously is relatively far from the reality of uh, the human proteome, uh, in the sense that many genes uh, have more than one isoform. And we've also, uh, to be more specific and answer the question, uh, addressed how separate domains, uh, so sort of basically expressing domains, the protein domains, 
uh, in absence of the rest of the protein. Um, yeah, th those are th these domains are, are uh, you know have relatively different activities than what you see with the full length. So the point is to at the end is that you need to start somewhere. You need to have a reference, and a reference we think is better to, to be generated with one full length. Uh, clone for each gene, and then starting from that as a community, not only us, obviously, but people will be able to add on top of that information and, and start better understanding the complexity of this thing. Thank you. We'll send the next question to Dr. Nan. If BIFC requires um, pre-knowledge of interacting protein pairs, how would you rate different techniques or options for identifying previously unknown binding pairs? Well, um, well, the first question is um, uh, if prior, prior knowledge is going to help in this case. Yes, definitely. Um, so there's always a choice of where to put the fragments on the uh, terminus of the protein uh, or the C, or um, there is a number of different combinations. If you know something about how the two proteins might be interacting with each other, then you will have a better chance of just going to that particular confirmation. And, uh, so that the two fragments can uh, be reforming the protein more efficiently. So that's the first question. Um, uh, the second question is, um, I um, would categorize BIFC as most uh, useful for um, uh, in visualization or detection um, technique. And uh, I have seen some applications for using BIFC for discovering a new protein-protein interactions, uh, but because of the difficulty, the problems that we just discussed in the first question, uh, it may need to be complemented by other techniques such as a uh, two hybrid um, uh, um, Y2H. Is to, <coughs> um, and uh, so the IP techniques, um, uh, immunoprecipitation, as well as some other uh, assays is more amenable to high throughput assays uh, type of uh, study. So, so I my take on BIFC is that uh, if you are interested in visualizing the interactions, then that's probably one of the uh, more uh, practical approaches. Thank you, um, Dr. Arkin. How does one distinguish between an allosteric inhibitor of a protein complex and a protein-protein interaction? Does it matter? <laughs> uh, so a lot of questions in there. Um, well, depending on the discovery approach that you use, you may not be able to tell if it's allosteric or orthosteric. That means binding at the protein-protein interface. Um, if they're, if they're mutually exclusive from each other, it can be difficult to tell without a crystal structure or mutagenesis or the sort of things that you would use even to validate um, the binding site for an enzyme inhibitor. If they're um, non-competitive, I mean, if they're, yeah, if they're non-competitive, then you can show by varying the concentration of one or the other. The person is welcome to ask me, you know, email me about uh, detailed questions about how to measure that. Uh, now, if you use a site-directed technique, then you can choose where you want that to be. And the assay style that you use can also tweak that towards an orthosteric or an allosteric inhibitor. Now, whether it matters uh, is an excellent question, and I would say a largely unanswered question, even for enzymes, whether you want an orthosteric or an allosteric inhibitor. It uh, really depends on your challenges with selectivity, depends on the, um, the what how much of each material you have, if you want something that's non-competitive, say with a highly prevalent protein, uh, rather than competitive, it's harder to make something that's competitive if you have a high excess of the partner in the system. So I'd say that it really depends on the biology of the system and what's more technically feasible as well. Thank you. Um, for Dr. Vidal, what about the role of metabolites in the interactome? Um, these are being measured in an ohm fashion and may exert their effect through activating or inhibiting allosteri. Yeah, that's a wonderful question as well. Um, so definitely uh, these interactions are regulated very tightly and we measure what we can measure. 
uh, remember that at the end of my talk, uh, I took, um, I went very fast uh, through that slide, but um, I showed results about detecting something like a hundred really well-known protein-protein interactions involved in all kinds of different uh, biological functions. And, you know, at this stage with half a dozen assays, uh, we're starting to basically cover uh, that space almost entirely. Um, this being said, it's, it's, an, it's, 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 a, it's an excellent question. Uh, once, uh, you know, you have a set of interactions that can happen, uh, again, that's the beauty of the session, uh, you know, you want to know where these interactions happen in the cell, and that was a beautiful uh, talk from Shouling. Um, you want to know what, um, what modulates these interactions, and metabolites obviously uh, are good candidates for that. Um, and then, as Michelle just showed you, you want to do yourself some sort of perturbation uh, modification to try to study the function of these interactions. So, it's an excellent question. I guess, you know, again, the answer is you got to start somewhere and then build up. Um. Thank you. Um, the next question for Dr. Nan. Can you use um, BIFC technique for studying the protein-protein interaction between two different cell surface proteins? Well, that's a, that's a really nice question. I uh, haven't thought about this, but I, I think in theory, yes. Um, uh, the two surface proteins, um, if they're on the same cell, of course, um, there is a good chance that they're going to run into each other. And if there is um, a transient or um, uh, uh, stable interactions between the two proteins, so you may be able to capture them because of the slow diffusion of proteins, I would say the chances are probably even better. Um, if you're talking about uh, potential interactions between two cells, uh, when they're in contact with each other, um, that might still be a possibility, although I have not seen an example uh, for that type of application. But this, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Arkin, um, what types of determining factors are there in the microenvironment that can drive the interactions, the protein interactions? Subcellular localization is a really big one for intracellular interactions. Uh, so many proteins are part of dynamic complexes that have scaffolding functions, scaffolding domains, post-translational modifications that regulate those scaffolding domains. Protein crowding, just overall crowding in the cell, I'd say is an unknown. We don't, um, it's something that single molecule experiments can hopefully get at better. And uh, so these kind of nonspecific interactions, just that stuff is crammed together in the cell. Then for membrane proteins and extracellular membrane protein interactions, um, membrane protein self-association plays a big role in signaling. Polarization of the membrane, when you get a positive signal, can aggregate, as is well known, say, for, the, for immune cells, an aggregation of receptors on one piece of the cell to get a whole signaling complex that can be quite large and uh, many copies of the same system. So. It's a regulated function. It's an important piece of how protein complexes are assembled and how they're um, how they're activated. Thank you. Um, and now we have time for just one more question, and I'll open it up to all three panelists. Um, somebody asked about studying protein-protein interactions in the extracellular extracellular space. Do any of you have suggestions for approaches that would be helpful for studying this? Does anyone want to jump in? Well, I, I can start. Um, one, depends a little bit on whether we're talking about two proteins that are secreted proteins or if one is stuck to a cell or to the ECM, the extracellular matrix. But uh, antibodies have been really good for studying extracellular proteins. And there are some very good high-throughput methods now. There are some groups that do very good high-throughput approaches to identifying antibodies that um, target specific epitopes or specific complexes or uh, specific proteins in the extracellular or um, the extracellular side of the membrane space. Thank you. Yeah, um, sure. 
Yeah, can I jump in here? So uh, I, I uh, uh, second Michelle's points and that antibodies can be a very good choice in this case because um, in, even uh, in a lifestyle or life specimen uh, type of setting, the antibodies will work well uh, by binding to some uh, either soluble, uh, soluble factors or the ECM uh, without having to uh, worry about the permeability of the antibodies or accessibility of the antigens to the antibodies. And uh, we have good ways to label the antibodies, um, tagging them with different fluorophores. So there, there you have many choices, whether it's um, FRET-based or colocalization-based type of studies. And uh, I imagine those, those um, by using the antibodies, we can easily do um, single molecule level or high resolution um, palm storm type of imaging uh, to study protein protein interactions. So, um, once it's outside of the cell, it um, seems to me there's even more choices. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses are displayed on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today and for sharing your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Vidal, Dr. Nan, and Dr. Arkin, as well as our webinar sponsor, Rockland Immunochemicals. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>